Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on, a, on, a, on a déjà commencé la journée. Uh, um, je crois que tout le monde a bu assez de café. Il y en a encore. Um, so we're going to start. Uh, so before I, I have the, the real pleasure and thrill of introducing both uh, Nina Schuller and Howard Goldman, I, I would ask them if they would come and, 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 and sit down and feels like the Dick Cavett show. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Alors, je vais commencer avec l'introduction de, de, de Dr. Schooler. Um, Nina Schooler est professeure de psychiatrie et de sciences comportementales au Downstate Medical Center de l'Université de l'État de New York. En plus d'occuper d'autres postes, dans tous ses rôles, elle effectue des recherches sur les, euh, sur les traitements et l'évolution au long terme de la schizophrénie. Elle est membre de, de, du American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, du Collegium International Neuropharmacologium, uh, the American Psychological Association and the American Psychological Society. Le professeur Schooler a été président de l'American Psychological Association et de l'Association for Clinical Psychosocial Research, en plus d'avoir été élu conseillère au CINP. Elle a publié de nombreux articles dans euh, des revues savantes de psychiatrie et a dirigé la rédaction d'ouvrages sur les essais cliniques psychiatriques, l'évaluation clinique et les méthodes de la recherche. Elle a obtenu son doctorat en psychologie euh, sociale de l'Université Columbia à New York. Elle occupe plus tard des postes de direction au National Institute of Mental Health à Bethesda, où elle a dirigé une série importante d'essais cliniques multicentriques sur le traitement médico, euh, médicamenteux et psychosociaux de la psychiatrie. Um, Nina Schooler is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at State University in New York, down, Downstate Medical Center. Um, in all of these settings, she, she conducts research on the treatment of schizophrenia and its long-term course. She is a fellow of the American College of Schizophrenia and its long-term course. She is a fellow of the American College. Sorry, she is a fellow of the American College of Neuropsychology. Pharmacology and the Collegium International Neuropsychopharmacologicum, uh, the American Psychological Association, and the American Psychological Society. Professor Schooler has been president of the American Psychopathological Association and the Association of Clinical Psychosocial Research, and has served as elected counselor for the CINP. She has published widely in peer-reviewed psychiatric literature and has served as an editor for volumes related to psychiatric clinical trials, clinical assessment, and research methods. She received her PhD in social psychology at Columbia University in New York um, and later served in leadership positions in the National Institute of Mental Health, Bethesda, Maryland, where she led a series of significant multi-center clinical trials on medication and psychosocial treatment for schizophrenia. So that's Nina. <laughs> Howard Goldman uh, est médecin et a un doctorat et est professeur de psychiatrie à l'école de médecine de l'Université de Maryland. Il a obtenu un doctorat en médecine de l'Université Harvard ainsi qu'un doctorat en recherche sur les politiques sociales de à l'Université Brandeis. Il est chercheur en politique et services en santé mentale et est l'auteur de 300 publications dans la littérature professionnelle. Dr. Goldman est le rédacteur en chef de Psychiatric Services. Depuis, il a été le rédacteur scientifique principal du Surgeon General's Report on Mental Health, méritant à ce titre la médaille du Surgeon General. Le Dr. Goldman a été le directeur du réseau de recherche sur les politiques en santé mentale de la Fondation MacArthur pendant 10 ans. Il a été élu en 1996 à la National Academy of Social Insurance et en 2002 à l'Institut de médecine. Howard Goldman is both a physician and a um, PhD uh, and is professor in psychiatry at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Dr. Goldman received his MD from Harvard University and PhD in social policy research from Brandeis University. He is a mental health service and policy researcher 
and who is the author of 300 publications in the professional literature. Dr. Goldman is the editor of Psychiatric Services. He served as the senior scientific editor of the Surgeon General's Report on Mental Health, for which he was awarded the Surgeon General's Medallion. For a decade, Dr. Goldman directed the MacArthur Foundation Network on Mental Health Policy Research, and in 1996, he was elected to the National Academy of Social Insurance, and in 2002, he was elected to the Institute of Medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, Nina Schooler, Howard Goldman. Merci beaucoup, Jacques. Thank you very much, Jacques. Wow. Uh, Is that pretty good? <laughs> yeah, right. So why don't you start? Yeah. I, I feel um, this feels like a talk show <laughs> environment. <laughs> and um, I think that is actually what we hope to do, is exchange some ideas with one another uh, and with you all as well. Right. We, we had talked about we'll probably go back and forth three times and then we'll have some questions, and right. then we'll hear from Pat McGorry. We decided to do something a little more um, relaxed, and both of us are conversational a bit. Um, it's really, really quite a pleasure to be here. It's, this is a very challenging project, and one of the things we want to convey is that uh, we don't exactly know how this thing will work we know what the pieces need to be. We know we have the right people in the room to do it. And we wanted to share some of our experiences uh, with challenges working in multidisciplinary and um, <clears throat> large scale enterprises of this type in mental health service delivery. And we're going to talk a little bit about our respective careers and how in fact much of what we've done over our careers separately now has us working uh, in the same project on early intervention in schizophrenia. Even though we work in very different ways or started in very different places, although we both met for the first time in the late 1970s at the National Institute of Mental Health where we both were working. Uh, it's very common in situations like this to establish your bona fides, but I, I feel like the most important thing for me to do is connect my Canadian interests to yours. In fact, I was reflecting on it. I came here from Washington, D.C. on a Canada regional jet. I was wearing a suit that was tailored in Canada. By the time I was 15, I had visited five of the provinces of this great country, um, traveled many of its rivers and waters by canoe. I've been in the Boundary Waters in Quetico Superior. I've, <clears throat> I've portaged from Dixon to Bonfield, the three miles in Algonquin State Park, played lots of hockey. <laughs> and um, I grew up in Detroit, which of course is a suburb of Windsor, Ontario. <laughs> My high school was in downtown Detroit, and I looked out the eight-story window of, of my high, high school at the Ambassador Bridge into the sun parlor of Canada. <coughs> Drove through that same sun parlor when I went to school for 12 years in Boston, driving between Detroit. And I've grown to be very fond of Canada and uh, its social values, and it's very exciting to be able to be part of this project and to be here. When Jacques did his introduction, he mentioned the MacArthur Network on Mental Health Policy Research. And after Nina describes a little bit about her experiences now working on this project for ab about a year in a formative way, I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about the MacArthur Network and its connection to these kinds of networks. And then we'll talk about some of the multi-site uh, projects we've participated in. So I'll turn it over to Nina, and then I'll be back in just a minute. <laughs> which, which gives me a signal as to about how long I should speak. So when Howard was speaking, um, I, hadn't re I hadn't remembered uh, some of my earlier personal connections to Canada. Uh, but I, too, uh, portaged in Algonquin Provincial yeah. Park, <laughs> Provincial Park many, many years ago. And um, uh, what I remember most from that trip uh, was meeting a moose um, head on, who I think was as startled as we were, uh, but we backed away first. Um, what's, what's probably more important 
for me in this context is um, just to reflect again on what I've experienced in, the, in connection with TRAM. So this has been my first direct experience with CIHR um, and um, uh, a continuing experience over the last year or so with the uh, Graham Beck Foundation. And what was most striking to me as part of the selection panel activities when we were reviewed um, the um, expressions of, int of interest that we received was, first of all, how rich they were. Um, and second of all, how many activities were ongoing in Canada. Um, I was almost, uh, I was acronym fatigued uh, by the end of my reviews, but I was really struck by how many things are going on in different provinces and at different levels, from small community to larger, um, uh, more integrated programs. And I think the other thing um, that struck me, and this is perhaps um, an American uh, perception, well, I guess it's the perception of all people when you're closer to something as opposed to being more distant. So in the United States, um, if someone mentions the name of a state, um, one almost immediately has an image of what that state represents. And I think until I started reading the details of some of the um, uh, expressions of interest, I didn't have a sense that I should have had of the huge diversity that there is across Canada. That this is not, a, I'm, I've certainly been aware that it's a bilingual country and that it's also a country that pays much more attention to its First Nations and Indigenous peoples than the United States does but I didn't have a sense of the true breadth of differences across the country. Those, re those add to richness, uh, but they also, of course, um, contribute to challenges um, in developing a pan-Canadian um, pan network. So let me turn it back to Howard to talk about experiences, and then I'll say a, little, a few words about mine. Great. Thanks, Nina. Uh, when Jacques did his introduction, he mentioned that I had chaired this um, MacArthur Foundation network in mental health policy research. And that was a very special opportunity. We slowly built a group of uh, leading investigators who work in the area of mental health policy, along with stakeholders and um, <clears throat> policy makers themselves. Now, those networks are are, are much smaller in size, and they provide seed money to do research. But the most important thing, I think, from that experience to share with you um, is that it takes, uh, it, it takes some time, as we heard yesterday about the Stroke Network, to really find your sea legs and to know how to proceed. It also takes some doing and real personal commitment on the part of all the participants in the network to work as a team. We brought together some pretty big stars in research. Virtually everyone who sat at our table might just as well have led the enterprise. They usually have me chair things because otherwise I disrupt them. <laughs> so it made me have to have to attend. The leader of a network has a special responsibility to keep everyone working uh, together towards a common end and recognizing their individuality as well as the common purpose. I like to say that the main use I've, uh, I've had for my training as a psychiatrist is in managing enterprises of that nature. We were able very successfully to do two things that I think are relevant to this enterprise. One is that we focused on several large transformational policy ideas. And we recognized that it would take time to achieve those goals. 
but we had those goals in mind as we took a series of more incremental scientific steps that would influence policy to achieve that goal. In our instance, the main focus of our activity of that nature was on improving insurance coverage, health insurance coverage, for the treatment of mental illness. And there was a, several avenues of research that needed to be conducted in order to pave the way over time for this particular achievement. And we were able to do that both with the resources that we had as a network, but also as a team to leverage other resources from other funders to accomplish this goal. So the two lessons here that I think are relevant, really, as we heard yesterday more and more about your activities and about the Stroke Network, is that we can achieve big changes if we have strategic vision about how to use the smaller activities that we can do and put them together into a sequence of changes to accomplish that big goal. And second, that it re may require the leveraging of additional funds. In our case, we used research funds from a variety of sources, public and private, to do our studies. And ultimately, those studies figured prominently in the legislative discussion that led to the passage of the Parity Act in 2008 and ultimately to its incorporation into our health care reform. So we needed multiple resources, we needed to work together, we needed a strategic vision of where we were going, recognizing that we would get there in a series of bite-sized pieces that could be accomplished. So I thought I wanted to share that particular experience with you about that network. And then Nina and I are going to do one back and forth about how we converged in our research in the same place, coming from very different starting points. So um, the, term that, the term that I've always used in the work that I've done um, historically has been multi-center studies. And um, in one way, um, multi-center studies do represent um, a network. Um, they represent a network of investigators, and they represent a usually a network of sites. And the coming together of these groups um, happens in a variety of ways. Um, my own personal experience has led me from um, studies that always had scope and scale but were defined differently. So I began with um, very clear, randomized clinical trials of medications, which are um, uh, in many ways um, simple, uh, simple because the independent variable, the thing that you're trying to manipulate, is very straightforward. Uh, drugs uh, and come in pill sizes, uh, they can be easily calibrated, and you can be very, very confident that they're the same whether you're doing them at one place or at another place, unless somebody screws up really badly. Um, and what I've moved to over the years have been increasingly complex studies with complex designs and that involve multiple kinds of interventions and uh, including fairly complex uh, psychosocial interventions. And most recently, I've been involved in studies that can really only be described as implementation research, in that what they're trying to do is implement programs and then evaluate whether these programs are successful or not. One thing that's been very interesting for me personally has been um, giving up something that I hold dear, which is the ability to make absolutely clear, to recognize clear-cut decision points um, in research. Um, in a study where you're comparing two drugs or a drug and placebo, uh, there is going to, there's going to be an answer. And the answer is either going to be, um, we cannot distinguish these two, or we can. Um, in a study or a program 
that looks at a more integrated kind of intervention, that becomes much, much more difficult. You will be able to say the intervention did or didn't work, but the question of what are the critical ingredients becomes a much, much more difficult question. And I think that what's, what I've come to recognize is that in the areas that I'm interested in, um, which is primarily schizophrenia, most of the things that are going to be of most interest and to me of most importance are going to be these kinds of multifaceted uh, interventions. And that the ability to tease them apart in fine detail um, is not going to be available. The other issue is that as the studies, um, as the interventions become more complex, um, so also do the sizes of the networks that need to be engaged to do these complex studies uh, become larger. And the, the challenge um, in this context, the challenge for me in terms of trying, of leading these studies and um, being central to them is finding ways to make, to feel as though the studies and the programs belong to the group rather than to the individual. And one thing that I've recognized is that for some people, the ability to say we is easy. Um, other people um, either think of we as the royal we or else are a little franker about it and see it as I. Um, the, for people in networks to work well, that's a huge challenge. It really has to be we rather than I or the, the royal we. And I think that the um, important part of that gets down to one of the points that was made um, yesterday uh, in the discussion of the stroke network, which is it took a little while to figure out who the right players were. And I think that was a very gentle way um, of saying uh, that some of the eyes had to go uh, so that the we's could, uh, could prevail um, and, could, uh, and could work together. Um, and I think that's a really uh, critical uh, element. And what's fascinating to me is that it's not necessarily always an element that can be discerned uh, really well in advance, and maybe that's one of the reasons uh, that some things uh, start out a little slower, um, uh, a little slower than many of us might have liked. Um, the S Howard mentioned earlier, and he'll say a little bit more about this in a minute from his perspective, that we're both currently working on a National Institute of Mental Health project which is called the RAISE Initiative, which stands for Recovery After Initial an Initial Schizophrenia Episode. And we're each involved in one of, we're, we're involved in each of us in different um, uh, networks that have been spawned by that NIMH initiative. And what that has been is very clear. These are all, these are large groups and they involve um, multiple component interventions rather than um, standalone ones. But they still represent, I think, um, something that's quite different in terms of scope from the sort of network uh, that TRAM is envisioned, uh, envisioned to be. Let me stop there and turn it back uh, to you, Howard. Great, Nina. You're reminding me of several things that I had wanted to say. I, I know that the composition of these uh, teams that work have changed. I know over your <coughs> career who's been involved in the network change, and the, the same thing is, is uh, true for me. I, I, even though I was trained as a clinician, my initial research <coughs> excuse me, were on evaluation studies of large system change efforts. In the late 1970s at the National Institute of Mental Health, there was an effort to uh, develop a community support program. It was to change really the focus and the, the whole strategy towards uh, dealing with the deinstitutionalization of people with severe and persistent mental illness. And the thought at the time was that we needed to uh, break down silos and promote uh, the integration of systems and, and shift the paradigm in, in service delivery. 
<clears throat> and we did a series of studies evaluating the community support program. Uh, then the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation wanted to change the governance structure for uh, urban mental health systems and create local mental health authorities. And we did a study of that systems change. And a series of systems change uh, strategies were undertaken in the United States. And uh, at, at one time, uh, we thought that our center ought to be named the Center for the Study of No Difference Findings. Uh, I used to give, give a talk uh, that I used to call uh, Why Services Researchers Have Round Shoulders and Flat Foreheads. <laughs> and it was that policymakers and service d delivery uh, gurus would ask us very profound questions and we would scratch our heads and shrug our shoulders rounding them with every new study, but every study would come to the conclusion that maybe we ought to pay attention to the quality of the treatment services. <laughs> and we would slap ourselves in the forehead and move to the next systems change study until finally it occurred to us that maybe the issue was that systems change was necessary, but it wasn't really sufficient to produce the kind of person level and family level change that was needed. And suddenly this clinician trained came to the conclusion that it might be due to the quality of the services that were being delivered. And so our, our research group and other similarly situated research groups uh, became much more involved in implementation research, implementation of, uh, of uh, evidence-based practices. And that's how Nina and I, who used to talk about schizophrenia at one level in the late 1970s, now come to be working on a project together with, with the same mix of stakeholders and investigators and administrators and policy makers trying to change the way we deliver services to people with severe and persistent mental illness by intervening so early that they don't become disabled. And we have very active interest by the directors of mental health services and financing entities in the United States. And it's really been very exciting to be able to work on that and particularly exciting for us to see a convergence both in our work in the States, but now to have been invited by the GBF and CIHR to work and help with the launch of this particular project. It's a challenge, it's an honor, and uh, it's very exciting to be part of the process. Right. I, I just wanted to, um, a, a ditto. I just wanted to say one last thing, and that is this has been a real uh, learning experience for us, the selection panel group, and I think um, also um, for uh, CIHR and uh, GBF. And um, I think that there, that as you all are evolving in your thinking about how this network, how the networks that you're going to be involved in will look, um, we're also um, evolving in our thinking. And I think that you will see some changes that come up, and that's the advantage of this strengthening workshop. So not only are we strengthening, um, are, are you all strengthening? We're, we're going to get we're going to get stronger, stronger, and I think clearer um, for everybody um, as well. That's great. The greatest experiences of my career. Now I've been doing research in mental health for 40 years, and they come from these kinds of collaborations. It's a great opportunity to have been engaged in this process. Um, I came here from Serbia where I'm working with a group of investigators in southeastern Europe. And uh, the energy of uh, young people working in this field together with people who've done it for a long time is, is a very supercharged, great opportunity. Uh, and I look forward to participating over time. Now, I was talking off camera here to, uh, to Ross, who wanted to know if we wanted questions. I guess within the requirements of time. Two questions. Two questions. That would be fine. We can't tell you who's going to win. <laughs> we don't know that yet. Oh, so there'll only be one question. <laughs> okay. The light is so bright. 
Yeah. Somebody go. A number, someone's handing out the mics. Okay, I think good. Um, a number of the proposals yesterday mentioned the need for better public education about serious mental illnesses. As an American Canadian, I am aware of the fact that um, both of our countries share really inadequate public understanding of severe mental illnesses, even down to the level of recognizing the early warning signs of psychosis. I imagine that you've been with groups of people who have contemplated this problem in the US. What do you think the barriers have been to having good quality public education? And did you ever come up with some solutions that you would still like to see implemented to improve public literacy about mental illness? I'll, I'll start. Okay. So, um, one of the, this is one of those areas that I think really benefits from the bottom up rather than the top, uh, top down approach. And um, just let me give you one example of a uh, teacher who I know who is a family member um, who has developed a program of educational tools for kids in um, uh, primary and secondary schools in the New York area. Her name's Janet Susson. It's a very, very successful program uh, as measured by kids' information acquisition and uh, you know knowledge and understanding and reporting of stigma before and after the program. But it's small and it's very local. And I think the um, issues of broader education um, are really challenging. And one of the things that's, I think, going to be important in the con it could be important, I should say, in the context of the tram network, <laughs> where the goal, one of the goals is to increase access. And one way to increase access is to increase public information so that people know what they're looking for and therefore will be more willing uh, to access. So that's just one way in which that could work. My simple answer to your question about do I understand why we're so slow is I don't have a clue. On the other hand, there is an intervention that I don't know whether, Pat, you're going to talk about mental health first aid at all? Yeah, it, Australia has given us many things, including our next speaker, and uh, one of them is mental health first aid, which is an effort at promoting mental health literacy and also improving uh, citizens' response to uh, individuals who are manifesting signs or symptoms of uh, mental disorder, and it, 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 it's a very good structural intervention that you might want to look at. Sam? Stan. I point with the microphone and then I lose the volume. Thanks, Joel. I, I really appreciate your thoughtful comments, and I wonder if I could paraphrase. Uh, all networks aren't the same, and all networks aren't designed for the same thing. I think that's a really key key comment for us. I'd like to really pick your brains in public. Um, what, what do you see being the difference between a network designed to do a multi-site project as opposed to a network designed to create collective impact? Collective impact, not multi-stakeholder engagement. And I'd love to hear your constructs about those two different things. So they're very, very different approaches. Yeah. Um, Howard has graciously allowed me to allowed me to go first, so um, as if I control this. <laughs> right. So the 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 first of all the multi-site pro the single project multi-site network is I think a vastly it's it's difficult enough, but it's vastly simpler because. Um, in that situation, there's a single goal that everybody has agreed to uh, in advance or that people will sign on to um, or not if they don't happen to like that goal. In a network that's designed for, for, the, for the second purpose, I think it's more complicated. 
and it's, it's definitely a more complicated structure because there have to be various components of that network. And one of the things that we saw yesterday is people used a variety of different ways of indicating how their networks might be organized, what the, what the, uh, what the structures might be. And um, my sense is that the issue, the, the challenge has to do with maintaining the overarching goal while allowing the individual components to develop so that they can contribute to that, to the larger overarching goal. And I think that's a, that, that's a challenge. If I put it into the context of, say, a multi-site study, what you often have are different components that then have to be brought together. And so it requires a, um, it requires a somewhat hierarchical structure in that in that kind of a network, in a net, there always has to be a point at the top, which may be an individual or a small group of individuals who have final, as it were, decision-making authority. Um, the former president of the United States, um, George Bush, said it one way, I'm the decider, um, which is not the model I like. But the model that another former president of the U.S. used um, was, I think, a much more attractive one to me. That was Harry Truman. And he had a sign on his desk which said, the buck stops here. And I think what he meant by that is less that, you know, I'm the guy who's going to tell everybody what to do, but all the things that happen that are under here come to here and eventually it's going to be my responsibility. And the way I took what he said was, please let's all do it right so that when the buck stops here, I'm in a good position to defend what we have decided to do. And that would be my model of a, of a network. I think my um, quick response is to say that the, the tram network may be more like a multi-site trial that begins with more input than is typical from, as we say, users and carers, stakeholders, and from policymakers, and has them engaged all along with a vision of how the results of that research will feed into the administration and policy related to services. And it's done in a more explicit way. And that's how I, so it has a lot to do with who are the participants in the network and how those participants are engaged to conduct what might be one large multi-site study or a series of smaller studies. That's really up to you all to, to tell us. But the LOI and the EOI give some guidance about that. And the intent is to involve people from the beginning so that it's better informed research and that its results can be better used. I think that's how I see the, the this issue. I, I just wanted to say that um, you see around the room members of the Beck family from GBF and they've brought us into their family. By joining with CIHR they've expanded the family and we've come over the process to become quite engaged with people from CIHR as well. And the family is growing, and now we have a whole room full of people who want to be part of this, um, this family, a family of stakeholders and investigators. And it's a great opportunity. I'm glad we had a chance to talk with you a little bit this morning. Great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <laughs> you know, Howard.